welcome everyone. So happy to see all of you. Um, so uh, the session today, I'm gonna. I, I, I was just saying to Michaela, I uh, had some found some movie magic. Check this out. I'm, I love this. Uh, there we go. So the presentation today is on the book is Object Sculpture and Performance. Uh, which I've subtitled Somewhat Random Lessons from a Life uh, Thus Far Mostly Spent Reading, Studying, Collecting, and Occasionally Designing Books. Um, I wanted to start this presentation with a quick personal land acknowledgement. Uh, I'm presenting from Treaty 6 territory up in Edmonton. Um, and uh, this actually ties in nicely with uh, the topic of my presentation, which is uh, an acknowledgement that we are still connected uh, by the physical ground that we are on, even though um, all this, the, the workshops and stuff are ha happening virtually. Um, there is still a physical connection that is happening. Um, think of, uh, take that as mystically as you want, but it does play into a lot of my presentation today about the, the difference between uh, books as objects and books as physical things as opposed to ebooks or virtual reading. Um, now, my goal is not to suggest that one is better than the other, um, but it is uh, to give everyone some ammo that if you're one of the people who does still like physical books, um, there are very good reasons why that is something worth holding on to. Um, so, uh, uh, I don't know if I even introduce myself. My name is Winston Pye. Uh, I am, uh, I, I have a, I, I don't even know how to describe myself. Uh, I've been a lover of books since kindergarten uh, when I found the elementary school library. Uh, did a, a, two English degrees, one of them on the history of the book. Spent a career in communications and uh, graphic design and commercial writing. And I am now back in school studying to become a librarian. So uh, my, my world has been literally and also figuratively surrounded by books. The purpose of this workshop, and it is a rerun of, a, uh, of, this, of the workshop I did two years ago live. So I can't remember if some of you have been there before. Hopefully you pick up something new or are reminded of something. Uh, but Basically, uh, I, I have three goals. Uh, one is to sort of provide another layer of appreciation for your books. Um, a lot of readers focus on the words. Um, I, 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 I'm uh, wanting to sort of add another uh, layer of potential meaning and appreciation to it. Uh, second, I've always described when words collide as the DVD extras of the What? How did that happen? Okay. Was I unmuted? Was I muted for long? No, just a couple of seconds. Oh, weird. Okay. Everybody. All right. Um, where was I? Oh, DVD extras, right. So I've always thought of when words collide as the DVD extras of the book world. So the behind the scenes stuff. So I'm hoping to throw some behind the scenes ideas at you about the books. And lastly, uh, want to arm you with some solid arguments for keeping your physical books. Uh, I am, uh, my bias is very clear. I love physical books. I have an ebook reader as well, but my thing is the physical books for a lot of different reasons. So basically this is gonna be 40 minutes of justifications and rationalizations for buying books and collecting books and uh, not even necessarily reading the books. So we'll get to that. So uh, we'll be talking about the three sort of broad ideas, the book as an object, the book as sculpture and the book as performance. So uh, let's get going there. Oh, that was the once upon a time. That was me. So the book is object. When tech geek and book nerd collide. Um, so I've always been fascinated by the technology of print production. So it's uh, it's um, oh, hang on here. Right. Sorry. Um, so I'm going to take us back back to the beginning. So. 
as a concept, books are 5,000 to 5,500 years old. Um, this particular object, uh, here, let me go here. This object is a Sumerian or Akkadian uh, cuneiform tablet. It's one of four cuneiform tablets that we have, uh, that, that they have in the Special Collections Library, the Bruce Peel Special Collections at the University of Alberta. And so until very, very recently, books as a storehouse of knowledge separate and outside of us as human beings, outside of us as biological memory storage is like 5,000, say almost 6,000 years old now. Audiobooks only came around in 1932, which is only 90 years ago. Ebooks started, uh, I, I'm gonna argue with Project Gutenberg that started in 1971. And the iPhone and the Kindle came about 2007. Uh, I can't remember when the iPad came out, but um, so th the whole notion of ebooks is very new. Now, going back all the way to these cuneiform tablets, um, these things were uh, hard to make, they were expensive to store. Um, there are a lot of reasons why ebooks are great, but um, having these things stored on clay tablets. Uh, what, it, what ended up happening is societies would store only the most important pieces of information, which would generally be religious texts, um, epic stories, or tax records. So this particular clay tablet is a tax receipt uh, documenting uh, the number of lambs that were granted to the government uh, from a particular person. So if you think about your wallet or purse or coat pocket right now, and all those little bits of paper that show your receipts for things you've bought. This is the 5,000-year-old uh, version of it. And so for 5,000 years now, books have been physical objects that live outside of ourselves. And my favorite thing about books, uh, physical books, is that there is no additional technological intervention required to consume them. So um, people make jokes about the fact that yes, that books don't need batteries. But I don't think most people realize how profound that is. Um, these days when all of, uh, a lot of people are sort of just taking photos of their receipts and they're just storing these photos on the phone, every one of us has heard a story of someone whose phone when they upgraded or lost their phone, lost like a year's worth of photos or something like that. Um, and yet this thing is still here 5,000 years later for us to literally just pick up and aside from not being able to read cuneiform, you can read this. So if anyone, okay, not right now during COVID because of safety protocols, once we are able to visit the Bruce Peel Special Collections again, you can actually write them an email, book to see this thing in their reading area and come and hold a 3,500, uh, 35, no, 5,000 year old because it's from 3,500, uh, whatever the timestamp is that we go by these days. And so, um, so physical books are, are, are epic. So this is um, one uh, piece that's been making the news a lot. Uh, this is the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, it is one of the earliest literary stories ever recorded. Um, it's made this the 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 uh, it's made the uh, the news recently because the uh, the United States Department of Justice recently um, uh, what's the proper word took back from a rather controversial private company in the U.S. that had illegally bought and imported a clay tablet a five thousand year old clay tablet and snuck it into the U.S. But the Epic of Gilgamesh is the oldest story that we have on record. And the only reason it's around is because it was stored on a physical object, carved into clay. And um, this is one of the ironies of um, our book storage technology is the more efficient we've gotten, the shorter the lifespan of the material. So you have clay tablets, which are, as you can imagine, very hard to store and only certain stories or pieces are deemed worth putting it there versus the internet where anyone can throw anything up there. 
but six months from now, the website might be gone. And so uh, there's this strange irony that uh, the, the better able we are storing, uh, the more efficiently we are storing our stories and our information, the shorter and shorter the lifespan of it. And it's actually a huge problem in the library world on how to document and archive electronic stuff. So for those of you who are writers and are doing the ebook publishing, please, I beg of you, at least, um, uh, at least print out multiple copies, leave them places, give them to people. Um, there is a long-term goal to that that, I, that we'll come back to. So uh, in terms of book as object, I'll leave you with this one quote, which I really love uh, by Robert, uh, Roger Stoddard. No, oh, hang on here. So the book is object. Authors do not write books. Books are not written at all. They are manufactured by scribes and other artisans, by mechanics and other engineers, and by printing presses and other machines. So um, there's another quote coming down, uh, coming later that we'll uh, that we'll get to. But um, so the the book is object. Uh, it's got five thousand years of symbolic capital of significance in it, and that's part of what's carried forward and what we sort of connect into as writers, as publishers, as book designers. It's gotten to the point now uh, that that visual object has so much symbolic on it, capital on its own that in fact, it doesn't even need to have words in it. People recognize books and see it as a symbol of some importance, um, which is where we get into the second thing I wanna to talk to, the book is sculpture because the book can be a work of art even without the words. So uh, I have in my past had a lot of uh, more uh, absolute ways of looking at things. So for example, the idea of books as home decor used to really make me upset. Like, no, books are for reading, don't just put them up uh, you know, don't, don't just line your shelves of books that you never read for a particular look in your room. I've sort of come around a bit on that idea. Um, and this is the, where I get into the idea of the book as sculpture. Um, people who collect other forms of art, paintings on the wall, prints, um, wood sculptures. If any of you have a chance somewhere around, I believe there is a hidden art gallery virtually which if you ever come to the live When Words Collide conference is a hotel room hidden somewhere uh, and not clearly marked where some of our uh, artists that come to When Words Collide display their artwork. There is a wood sculptor there. there. There are people who do prints. These are things that you, you buy and display just for its own sake, for its own beauty's sake. And I have come around to the idea that those are valuable things as well for books. And that there's, that even your most beat up, most beloved paperback is therefore something that has value as a thing, not uh, as a work of art, not just as a carrier for someone, another work of art. So uh, one example I wanna show you, this is the, uh, I, I got to visit my sister in Los Angeles a few years ago, and she took me to the last bookstore in downtown LA and this is what uh, you're greeted by when you enter the store. Um, I believe these are books that either were too damaged to sell or um, they had too many copies of or who knows why, but rather than destroy those books, they took the meaning that's embedded in the, uh, in the book and turned it into a work of art. And I've seen lots of examples of this, which I kind of really love. Uh, it's better than throwing books away, which uh, one time in my life I thought I would never do. But uh, especially now training as a librarian, there is a need to weed your collection sometimes. And 
there are only so many uh, little free book uh, libraries in the neighborhood that you can dump your extra books on. At some point, the value of them is different than the story in them. And you could do something like this. And so this, uh, uh, okay, I'm gonna preface this by saying that I've been very fortunate in my life that I've been able to actually start building up a collection. Uh, this is a picture of my living room shelves. And um, what I've done is literally taken some of my books and hung them on the wall to display them at art, as art. Now, I would love to hear anyone's feedback to this or this idea, um, but these are actually the complete books. Now, I think there is a difference between taking a picture of the cover of a book, framing it and sticking it on the wall, as compared to just putting the book on the wall. If you look in the background, I've got a giant painting uh, hanging back there. It's not just the image, it's the fact that it is a canvas and that it's hanging away from the wall and you can see the edges of the, the, the physical object. So um, the book as sculpture is sort of, for me, that was the next step from the book as the object where I, I've sort of kept moving away from just being about the writing. And I should have asked at the beginning, I don't know how many of you are writers or more re identify as readers, but uh, if you're writers, uh, I'm about to, to make an argument that may not make you happy. Um, so the book is performance. So this is, this is for me, my big idea that I love playing around with uh, as I, as I, um, uh, as I work through these ideas, and th this is my curiosity about books as object, books as sculpture. The next step is that book as performance. So this quote by John Feather, uh, authors can only envisage the dissemination of their works in the physical form that is the normal product of the techniques available at the time of writing. So, um, this, what this is suggesting is that, for example, Charles Dickens, who wrote a lot of his novels in uh, what they called part issue format, two chapters at a time. In fact, I believe it was 32 pages at a time, two signatures. Um, so he wrote to a specific length for every chapter to fit what was the printing press available at the time. I have sometimes lay awake wondering what Charles Dickens would have done had he had a blog of his own and could just write as long as he wanted, as often as he wanted. And we have these giant Dickens novels where he just wrote them a chapter at a time. It's basically like binge watching a, a TV series nowadays. No one, uh, Charles Dickens never meant for the entire uh, great expectations to be read in one sitting in one giant intimidating volume. He wrote them a few chapters at a time, the way TV shows come out, uh, short episodes at a time. And yeah, some people enjoy binge watching them. Some people enjoy reading a Charles Dickens novel over in one sitting. But uh, to go back to the way Charles Dickens wrote it, what would it be like if you took Charles Dickens and only read two chapters and then waited a month for the next issue to come out. So uh, if you're writers now, it's fascinating to me because there are so many uh, normal products and techniques available at your time of writing now. Um, Winston, we do have a question from uh, oh. Charles Prepolek. Uh, he says, interesting, curious how you wall mount the books and do you do anything to them to keep them solid and square? In other words, are they still readable or are they closed off objects? Gotcha. Uh, this is the magic of, uh, so again, technology and art coming together. These are 3M cup hooks. Uh, I don't know if I've got a little one here. They're clear plastic with a little metal hook on them. And what I've got is two on the bottom and three on top. And so, uh, they're, they're jury rigged a bit to try and push the bottom hooks out a bit so that they angle back. Uh, but these are 
complete readable books. You can slide them out of the hooks. Uh, Long-term as a librarian, this is not a good way to archive or preserve the books. They are slowly by gravity being distorted out of shape. But um, uh, uh, what I can do is uh, I'm gonna take a note to maybe take a picture and throw it in the When Words Collide Facebook group or something about how those are hooked up. Hang on, I'm just taking some notes here, just like I would in real life. And so, yeah, so they're not closed off objects. You can slide them off the wall and read them. And in fact, because uh, a lot of books, not necessarily these ones, but a lot of books are in a generally, uh, um, uh, generally a uh, standard sizes, you can swap a similar size book uh, into those hooks. And uh, failing that, they are 3M hooks, which are brilliant because without leaving any nail holes on my wall, I can move them around fairly easily. Uh, not, quite a, not quite a sleeve, but I, I'll, I'll show you. It, so there, there's actually nothing, hold, the, the books look like they're just books floating on the wall. Um, so I'll have to do that. Okay, so, um, so books is performance. So for my master's degree in English, um, I basically made the argument, and I'm sorry to all of you who are authors, that the, uh, the, the, the author is not in fact the most important uh, character in the production of a book. And this is where I, I bring an analogy. My, my father was a lover of symphony music. So I grew up around books and symphony music. And that's probably influenced this uh, a lot. But to me, uh, it's not music until someone plays it. So Beethoven's Ninth Symphony isn't the manuscript. It isn't the black marks on the five lines showing what everyone wants to play. It's not music until it's actually been turned into a performance. And so in this world that we live in of, of books, we love books, we talk about literature, um, the, the focus for good reason is on the authors. We want to buy Charles's book on Sherlock Holmes. It, like we don't go out and name the designer of the book. We're not looking, well, very few of us are. <laughs> but the analogy I make is to a symphony orchestra, that until you have the instrumentation, until you have the concert hall, until you have a conductor who's sort of leading this performance of a manuscript, a musical manuscript written by Beethoven, let's say, um, it's not actually the piece of art that we appreciate as music. And so until a manuscript by an author is performed as a physical object or a virtual object, um, it doesn't actually exist as the piece of artwork that us as readers love and that us as book lovers love. And so um, what I argued was that uh, there are actually nine elements that, that that come into play that at some point the metaphor falls apart, but it, I, I draw the parallels to performing music. So there's a book. Uh, oh, I missed a bunch of the show and tell stuff. It's been a while since I've presented. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna backtrack quickly before I get into this. So the book is object. There is so that 5,000 year uh, history and information. So this particular volume, I don't know if some of you will recognize it. So it's a leather bound book from the looks of it. Um, this is actually my iPad case. So I do read electronic books. I think it's hilarious that I can have the entire, like more books than I have in my physical library around me on this one device. But for me, reading on screen never quite felt the same. And it's marginally better because I have wrapped the thing in a proper 
physical piece so that I can feel like I'm in the, 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 I'm in the concert hall, so to speak. And the other one I wanted to show on sort of the, the value of, or, or the symbolism in the object. So uh, I want you to take a look at this one and on your screen, I don't know how big this is. I will do the zoom up, but this is a Lego set that is designed in a book. It is called uh, Once Upon a Brick. And it is uh, actually in the pop-up genre, if you will. And uh, as a hilarious side anecdote, I went looking for this thing on my shelf to add to my pile of show and tell, and I couldn't find it because it was just so plain on the spine. So uh, for those of you who want to design books or designing books, make sure the spine is sharp and sticks out. So, um, so all of this to me uh, is, that, is that symphony performance idea. So to me, uh, I, I listed off the paper, the ink, the binding, the type design, as opposed to the typography, which is the use of the design of the individual letters on the page, cover and dust jacket design. And I know I'm competing uh, in this time slot with a session on book covers, which I'm really mad I had to miss. The text, so you're one of the nine. If you're a writer, your manuscript is one of the nine items. Uh, eight is what I call, is referred to as the paratext. And the paratext is all the text around your text. It's the footnotes, it's the back cover blurb, it's even how the title is put on the cover. And there's also the economics of it. And for those of you who are authors, there are lots of sessions which are great about uh, the difference between self-publishing and traditional publishing and having an agent and not having an agent. The, the, the sociological thing that's working underneath that is um, the symbolic capital, the cultural capital around things like being a hardcover book versus being a paperback book. Um, so I uh, want to start pulling out some more show and tell items about this idea of the book as performance. So um, one thing, recommendation. Uh, this is just for one of those elements or two of those elements, but the elements of typographic style by Robert Bringhurst, I highly recommend uh, because he's also a poet. And so he writes about type in a way that is magical to me. And I love this book and I just highly recommend it. If people are wanting uh, a, another layer of just going into um, the background of the book. So another of the instrumentation, if you want to call it that. So, so I'm going to keep drawing this uh, uh, comparison to music. So uh, these days, very popular are remixes and or else you get your concert recordings versus your studio recordings. Um, and if any of you are big concert goers, think about your favorite piece of music. Maybe it's classical, maybe it's pop culture, I don't know. Think about the difference between uh, going to the symphony in the sky, which is what we have when our Edmonton Symphony Orchestra performs out in the park, versus going to the Windspear and everyone's dressed to the nines in their suits, the exact same musicians, exact same conductor, exact same piece of music. The experience is fundamentally different because of the context, which in the book world is whether it's hardcover or softcover, or if you get an arc. Uh, okay, what are arcs stand for again? Um, advanced reading copies. So uh, if you haven't seen advanced reading copies, basically they're copies of books that aren't published yet that they send out to reviewers. And they still have typos, they haven't been fully edited, they don't have the final cover. It says ARC on it and it says do not resell and all this sort of stuff. You're basically reading essentially the final book but you're getting a sneak preview of it. And as you know it, as soon as you get the cover, it's like getting to listen in on a rehearsal with a big band. And then when you go see the final concert, it's like, oh, I got to see them practice this in the, in the studio. And 
this is my excuse for buying more than one copy of all of my favorite books. So uh, I'm sort of keeping on the time. Okay, so this is this is my origin story or the origin story of this, maybe one of them. So my favorite book in the world, and it's weird that I can even say that, but I think if I had to pick, if I had to pick one book, it's Dune. So I read that when I was in my teens, blew my mind. I love that book. But uh, for people of my age, uh, science fiction when we were younger was not real literature. It was not, uh, uh, I fear that it, in a lot of ways, Harlequin romances still have that problem of being dismissed as not real literature or not good writing. Um, and so th this goes back to the idea of cultural capital or symbolic capital. Back in my day, science fiction was not recognized as great literature. Uh, to some extent, I suppose it still isn't. And so this is where the whole notion of pulp fiction came from. Um, pulp books, because they were printed on cheap paper, because they weren't meant to last. If you think back to the clay tablets, the, uh, the, um, the Epic of Gilgamesh, science fiction not, was not worth putting on a tablet. It would never have made it on a tablet if we were still putting stories on clay, unless some intrepid writer snuck some clay off to the side and kept it. So I grew up with science fiction being uh, figuratively and literally not worth anything. They were beat up paperbacks. And so this is my the first copy of Dune that I ever purchased. Um, it's in pretty good shape because I took care of it, but cracked spine. Uh, for those of you who have a favorite book, it's probably been well read and well loved, and that's great. And so for me, this is what I thought science fiction was supposed to be. So flash forward a bunch of years. Uh, uh, so even before Amazon, even before the internet, uh, marketing people knew their audience. I somehow got on a mailing list for the Easton Press, which is this sort of higher end publisher in the US. Their books don't even have ISBNs because uh, it's basically saying, we're above being commercial. We don't need an ISBN. We're never gonna be in a store. These are fancy books. And I was completely blown away when one of the books they had on offer was this. So it is a leather bound, gold embossed, uh, got the ribbon bookmark, um, fancy, fancy end papers. Like I saw this when I'm used to this and I went, Oh, hang on a second. I'm going to give myself some more real estate. So I saw these two and I was like, are you even allowed to do this? Like, this is science fiction. This kind of binding is for your Shakespeare's and your Charles Dickens and all your canonical writers, which is a notion that we fortunately have all gotten rid of. Um, so this blew me away. I was like, yeah, this is how important this book is to me. This is how I think it should be read. It should be read like Shakespeare in a giant, heavy, mark my place with a ribbon sort of, uh, sort of thing. And this has got me thinking. So this is to me the, let's call this the symphony in the park version. And this is the, I'm gonna wear a tux and go to the Windspear concert hall and listen to my piece of music. The words inside it are identical. They're the same words in the exact same order. This is Frank Herbert's Dune. But these two performances of this one manuscript, of this one piece of writing, to me are hugely different. And so I have since accumulated uh, several other. So this copy of Dune, uh, which I love, is part of, what is this part of? Uh, okay, somewhere in here, oh, Penguin Classics. So the, this is the Penguin Galaxy. There's six science fiction classics. So uh, where in the time of clay art, uh, clay writing, uh, you, you would, the important things get stamped into clay and stored. Um, 
I was saying before that as we've gotten more efficient with things, so paper is more efficient than clay tablets, but it doesn't last as long as clay tablets. What happens is instead of uh, a society keeping their uh, most important pieces of uh, information or most important stories on the most permanent, most expensive storage media, what's happening is it becomes what gets reprinted. And so, um, the, the, the parallel music, which is hilarious, is how many times have you bought your favorite album every time it's come out from uh, vinyl to cassette to eight track to CD to electronic to whatever it is. What we as a society consider valuable, uh, we end up republishing. We keep moving into the next form. So I do have Dune as an ebook on my, on my, um, iPad. And if this thing were to fall out of favor and they stopped publishing Dune, eventually all of these copies could start wearing away. But at least fortunately, I know I've got one copy that's leather bound acid free paper that may last longer than this copy. It will definitely last longer than the electronic version because uh, I have electronic books that I can't read anymore because the software for it never got updated. And, uh, and in the far future, this might be the only version of Dune that survives and someone will find it and go, wow, this was actually pretty good. And like the Epic of Gilgamesh, oh yes, I should flip to the next photo. Like the Epic of Gilgamesh, oh, hang on. There, like the Epic of Gilgamesh, um, republish it. So this is my paperback copy of the Epic of Gilgamesh which is a translation of that clay tablet there. So th this is one of the advantages of paper books and more efficient storage. You can get more copies out there. You stick your, you put your book on Amazon or any of those Kobo ebook distribution, suddenly there can be infinite copies if people bother to keep them. And so the, the physicality of the books around us are a reflection of our values as a society, a reflection of what we consider important, uh, a reflection of what are, are valuable. Okay, so. 10 minute warning for you, Winston. Holy cow. Okay, we're gonna have to fly through this last part. This is just gonna be a show and tell of Dune books. So, Dune graphic novel. This is what I would call a remix. So uh, Frank Herbert, I don't know when comic books came about. Uh, Dune was written in 1968, I'm gonna say. Oh goodness, when was it written? I have no idea. No, they would be around at the same time. I don't know if there's ever been a Dune comic book. I don't know if Frank Herbert would have wanted Dune to be remixed as a comic book, but here are his words and his ideas done in a completely different way. It's still sort of Dune, but not quite Dune. And then this edition just came out recently. Ugh, it is gorgeous. The blue on the spot, like on this is brilliant, if you know the story. So what's interesting is this is a remix for fans. So this is not to introduce people to the book. This is for people who already know the book and want yet another copy that where the physical embodiment of the book matches the music. So uh, Beethoven's Fifth, if you've only ever heard it in the, the, the Symphony of the Park, but you love it, this is what you should pick up. Okay, um, let's see where I'm at because I've just been blathering on. Oh, okay, so some life lessons about books. So, Yes, you are allowed to judge a book by its cover. Um, so when I say my books are my friends, it's almost literal. They're like individual people to me. It's kind of, uh, it's a little out there. Um, but, uh, but the physicality of the book is your body language. So this is another metaphors, another of the metaphors that I use in, in how I enjoy my books is um, uh, the, the symphony in the, in the park versus symphony in the concert hall is sort of a parallel to 
showing up in sweats or showing up in a tux. It's still the same person inside. It's still the same ideas. It's the same stories coming out of the person's mouth. But uh, sorry, it does. There is an influence. Now, I'm not saying that you should only pick books by their cover. Um, to me, the message is that when all the pieces match and are in, the, in alignment, that's when you get the best experience. So um, uh, if this presentation was, if I was wearing a suit and tie and speaking very monotone and my slides were just comic sans with no images, it'd be the same content. It does matter. It does matter that all those things fit together. And so this copy of Dune, I think is brilliant because the physical part, everything matches the theme. And so you should dress to fit your brand or to fit your image. Um, uh, so yes, so you can judge a book by its cover. The trick is, does the cover match the inside contents? And uh, that applies to people too. Don't judge a book by cover. Don't judge a person by the outward appearance. But when their outward appearance doesn't match what's inside, that's actually a very good warning sign. No, you don't actually have to read every book you buy. So uh, this is definitely in the world of justifications, but uh, so, Part of it is when I'm buying multiple copies of the book, I'm not rereading it every time. I am enjoying a set, the, the performance of the piece doesn't require me to sit through the music again. It's kind of weird. There is something really special and unique about books in the way that they mix all these things together. <clears throat> uh, okay. So I, I saw a question in, in the thing. Oh, uh, Barbara, there are PhDs to be written on your question. Um, uh, I don't have a good answer for that. I would say there's some of both. Um, I, I would never say that it wasn't Beethoven's brilliant composing that uh, that, that, it's, that it's just a performance, it's all those things come together. You have to have a brilliant score or you're not gonna have a brilliant piece of music. So that foundation is critical. But I do think that yes, there is that, it's also not a piece of music until someone listens to it and hears it. So it's both those things for sure. Yeah. Um, okay, so I'm gonna speed through a last few slides. Um, things that you might find interesting. So. <clears throat> Um, no, you don't actually have to read every book. I'm just going to throw this as a recommendation out there. It is called uh, How to Talk About Books You Haven't Read. It's a translation of a French philosopher. It's actually quite hilarious talking about, but it, it's, it's a profound uh, look into how we consume, consume books. And if you think of it again, the peril to music, um, uh, not everyone even has heard the entire Beethoven's fifth, but everyone knows the first three notes. And that, that message, that, that, that meaning is already enough to be carried forward um, through the performance. So sometimes maybe we only have to perform the, the Reader's Digest abridged version of your, your masterwork and the message still gets across. Uh, oh. Right, collecting is not the same as hoarding. Uh, intention matters. And um, some of my book collection is hoarding. I have no reason to keep them, except maybe to turn them into art. That's a presentation tomorrow at two o'clock. Um, uh, but uh, having piles of books in your hallway is not necessarily hoarding. Um, some examples I wanted to bring up with that. I have four minutes. Okay. <clears throat> this book, no, oh, hang on here. This book is the exhibition guide whoops, for the Bruce P. Danzig collection of angling books. It is part of the 
uh, the Bruce Peel Special Collections Library. And a retired university prof has donated 6,000 books about fishing. He has not been hoarding these books. He has a passion for fishing. He has been collecting fishing books. And the head, as the head librarian has said about, uh, 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 about book, uh, library collections, libraries don't collect books, collectors collect books. And so there is no way in the past 40 years, the special collections library would have had the budget or the interest or the wherewithal to collect seven, uh, six or 7,000 books on fishing. This man with a passion for fishing, and I think he's a professor in marine biology, collected these books and went to the librarian and said, hey, do you want this collection? And now the University of Alberta Library has this amazing collection showing the history of fisheries. There's the same book on fishing, the Complete Angler it's called, republished a hundred times and in different editions. And it has, you can track the history of fishing and the tracking of fish populations because of these snapshots over time. Okay, three more minutes. Oh my goodness. Okay, what do I got here? We can always hang around if people don't have other presentations. Oh, okay, lovely. As well. Okay, so sidebar uh, about Sundoku and Marie Kondo. So where's my Marie Kondo book? I have it here. Marie Kondo, the life changing, all oh, these, okay. The life changing art of, oh, the life changing magic of tidying up. Um, so taking 4,000 books and alphabetizing them and putting them up neatly on your shelf is still tidying up. Um, Marie Kondo, I love her. She was misquoted about the 40 books being the maximum you should have. There is a specific context for that. And uh, the other piece that I'll pull from Japanese uh, uh, culture is the word sundoku. It's a, an invented word. Uh, what's the, a monogreen? Is that what those call? I don't know. But it's a Japanese word for buying books and letting them pile up unread. There is nothing wrong with doing that. And in fact, there is an archival reason for doing that. Even if you don't read them, the fact that you've thought to buy it and thought to keep it and thought to collect it means it will be another piece of our society. You're one little uh, piece of our society making a statement about what it considers important. Yes, graphic novels or books, even the ones without words. Highly recommend The Arrival by Sean Tan. Yes, audiobooks are books. Uh, and I said because, because hashtag science. Um, they are read, listening to audiobooks apparently sets off the same parts of your brain as reading a physical book. I don't know how. That's a whole other thing that would be fascinating to look at. And so, yes, enjoy your books any way you want because every performance of a book and especially uh, for an audience of one is valuable. So there we go, 1150 under the wire. Uh, I am happy to stick around if people have questions or want to see more show and tell. I realize I missed a bunch of things, <laughs> but I hope uh, you found it interesting and some uh, new ways to appreciate your own collections. Well, and thank you, Winston, for the incredible presentation on behalf of everybody who is still in chat or has popped out to go and head to something else. Thank you so much for sharing your love of books with us. It is um, it, it is really eye-opening and also gives us all an excuse to keep all of those copies of our favorite books that we have been meaning to get rid of and or read again. Um, thank you.